get the unmissable news stories of the day. This is the Beijing Hour. Examining the events that impact and shape China and the rest of the world. This is the Beijing Hour, one hour of news and information brought to you every weekday. Now here's your host. Shane Begum with you on this Thursday, October 3rd, 2024. You're listening to a special holiday edition of the Beijing Hour, coming to you live from the Chinese capital. On today's program, Chinese authorities have reported tens of millions of passenger trips on the third day of the National Day Golden Week holiday. Box office totals for the holiday period have already or already surpassed 1 billion yuan. The Lebanese officials say an Israeli attack that struck a health center in Beirut has killed at least six people. A Chinese envoy to the UN has called for a de-escalation of tensions in the Middle East. And a typhoon has struck southeast China, causing disruptions in Fujian province and in the Taiwan region. In the second half, we'll present you with an episode of our Footprints program, where we share the true life stories of people chasing dreams in China. And today we'll tell you the story of a French professional footballer who's now playing at Chinese club Qingdao Red Lions. Now checking the day's top stories. Authorities expect 60 million car trips on highways in China on the third day of the National Day holiday. They also anticipate more than 2 million individual trips by air and over 16,000 flights on Thursday. The railway network's expecting 17.3 million trips across the country. One popular tourist destination is Guizhou. The southwestern province is home to half of China's ethnic Miao people. Their unique culture is drawing more and more visitors to traditional villages. As Xu Xin Chen discovers Chinese people are open to experience different ethnic cultures. In 2008, the Olympic torch traveled to this Miao village in southwest China's Guizhou. The Olympic Games inspired the world to learn more about China. Langde Shangjai, Upper Langde Miao village. It is a village of Chinese ethnic minority Miao. Just a few hundred people live in the village. However, it is a popular tourist destination now. It attracts 3,000 to 4,000 people a day to get the full male experience. The traditional male architecture, wooden stilted houses and bridges give people a different vibe, reflecting the traditional but charming way of life of the male people. There are shops owned by the villagers that rent out traditional clothing to tourists for photo shoots and sell souvenirs. I'm very glad to see people come to our village. Ethnic minority culture is not like popular culture. People from all over China come here to experience things they have not seen before, things that are filled with local ethnic characteristics. First, it fulfills people's curiosity. Second, gives them a sense of the diversity of Chinese culture. And that curiosity and diverse culture have brought in not just tourists, but also investments. Guizhou is home to 4 million male people making for half of the entire nation's male population. There are many villages showcasing the ethnic group's traditional way of living that are preserved and passed on generations. At another village, I found a town Ho Ho, who have come all the way from Beijing, which is almost 2,000 kilometers away. She opened this bed and breakfast place. This is the Hongyang Miao village. To the village's west, there are two sanctuary mountains. It keeps its originality, and the air here is very good. When the fog lingers around the village, Tao said, it is like a scene straight out of fairy tales, much different from the concrete and steel scene in large cities. Tan rented wooden stilted houses from local villagers and turned them into a homestay. As more people get to know this part of China, stereotypes change. People said to me that in this place we can't have three days without rain. I've been living here for a year now. It only rains at night and there is great sunshine during the day. People then asked me if all the roads are rocky and muddy. I said, now smooth paved highway reaches all counties here. Some would think that the local people are poor. I then replied that Guizhou has hundreds of different festivals. Locals dress up in silver during celebration. Tourism in Guizhou is booming. The province has seen tourists and revenue grow by double digits and is ranking among the top 10 tourist destinations in China during this summer holiday. And to let more people know about the local craftsmanship, there are shops and factories that harness the local dyeing and embroidery skills, creating unique and culturally rich products. That was Xu Xinchen reporting from Guizhou province.
Moviegoers in China have spent more than a billion yuan so far this National Day holiday. And that's more than 142 million U.S. dollars, including pre-sales. The Volunteers, the battle of life and death that honors fallen soldiers of the Chinese people's volunteers in the early 1950s, leads the box office chart. Many young people favor comedy, while some others are going to the cinema with a sense of nostalgia. I think the two comedies this year feature actors I really like, Jackie Chan and Ge Yong. I grew up watching their movies, so I came today specifically to see these two films. It's because Jackie Chan hasn't been in any recent films for quite some time. This is his first collaboration with Mahua Fun Age. I think their partnership will be quite interesting. Ticket revenues saw a 10% rise on the first two days of the Golden Week. Well, today we present you with the fourth part of our series, China's Tech Journey. The report focuses on how exoskeleton technology is transforming industries and everyday lives across China. These wearable devices are now enhancing human strength, reducing physical strain, and revolutionizing sectors such as logistics, mining, and healthcare. Industry insiders are stressing the need for technological breakthroughs, suggesting these robots hold the potential to reshape the future. Yu Shan has the story. Airport baggage handling has long been a physically demanding job, requiring workers to load and unload countless suitcases in cramped airplane cargo holds under tight time constraints. But this labor-intensive task is being transformed with the introduction of exoskeleton robots. Once only seen in sci-fi movies like The Wandering Earth 2, these advanced technologies enable workers to lift heavy loads with ease, something that was nearly impossible with just their bare hands. With the exoskeleton, it feels like someone is pulling from behind, and it protects my lower back. The man wears a smart exoskeleton on his back, roughly the size of a backpack. With his assistance, a 20-kilogram suitcase feels about a third lighter. This highlights the core advantage of exoskeleton technology that is seamlessly integrating human movement, sensation, and cognition with machine capabilities. China began research and development in this field around 2000, with the first products hitting the market in 2015, primarily for medical rehabilitation purposes. ULS Robotics, a leading tech firm in this field, focuses on developing embodied robots. According to Chief Marketing Officer John Hua, their devices can help stroke patients regain physical function. Previously, patients relied on physical therapists to guide their recovery. With exoskeleton robots, they can now do rehabilitation exercises at home. As China's population is rapidly aging, elderly care is emerging as a new area where exoskeletons can make a significant impact. Many older adults don't have medical conditions, but as they age, their leg strength decreases. Climbing stairs becomes difficult, let alone going out. Our variable robots can help them walk and climb stairs. In China, exoskeletons have also found applications in areas such as mining, automotive manufacturing, logistics, and outdoor sports. By 2023, the market was valued at over 170 million yuan, or about 24 million U.S. dollars, with projections to grow nearly 14-fold over the next five years. Currently, many Chinese exoskeleton makers are integrated into the global supply chain, benefiting from significant advantages in production capacity and cost efficiency. Professor Liu Xiaoshan from the Shenzhen Artificial Intelligence Research Institute is upbeat about the future of China's exoskeleton market. He stresses that achieving breakthroughs in key technologies will be crucial to sustaining this growth. China really stands out in producing key components for robots, and it has a massive market to sell them. The last piece of the puzzle is the midstream technologies, like software design. 
which are currently being developed at full speed. Once that's down, the entire supply chain will be complete. He believes that exoskeleton and similar robots will become seamlessly integrated into daily life, much like wearing a pair of glasses. ULS Robotics have already developed over 5,000 products to meet a wide range of specific needs. CMO Zhang Hua says future exoskeletons will be smarter, more affordable, and with advancements in AI, even more responsive and attuned to users' needs. That was Yu Shen reporting on China's breakthroughs in exoskeleton technology. Tomorrow we'll take a look at another kind of robot designed to help people with visual disabilities. China's state-owned enterprises reported a 1.4% increase in revenues from January to August. Data from the finance ministry shows that their combined revenues were around 53.8 trillion yuan, or roughly 7.6 trillion U.S. dollars. SOE saw their debt-to-asset ratio stand at 64.9% at the end of August. Coming up, an attack on a health center in central Beirut has killed at least six people. Dive into news like never before with Deep Dive, the podcast from CGTN Radio. Join our global reporters for captivating stories and thought-provoking conversations. Search Deep Dive on your favorite podcast platforms and get ready to dive in. At 12 minutes past the hour, Lebanese health officials say at least six people were killed in an Israeli airstrike in central Beirut early Thursday. Israeli forces say they struck the health authority center, accusing it of being affiliated with Hezbollah. The Israeli army has said its strikes on the Lebanese capital have been precise. In southern Lebanon, eight Israeli soldiers were killed in fierce fighting with Hezbollah on Wednesday. Hezbollah says it destroyed three Israeli tanks as they advanced towards Lebanese border village. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to respond to this week's missile attacks from Iran. Iranian President Massoud Pazeshkian has warned of a strong response from Tehran to any further Israeli actions against it. Pazeshkian also sought to rally other nations to its side during his visit to Qatar. Iranian media says the missile attacks destroyed several F-35 fighter jets in Israel. Iran's ambassador to the United Nations says the missiles against Israel were launched in self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter and were a direct response to repeated acts of aggression. Meanwhile, the Israeli military claims its air force remains functional and the attacks were ineffective. And Trent Murray has more from Tel Aviv. Well, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been consulting with senior ministers in his government as well as intelligence and military chiefs charting how they will respond to this Iranian ballistic missile attack. The IDF has said 181 of those missiles was fired towards the state of Israel. The air defence system was largely able to intercept most of them with the assistance of two US warships, but an admission that some of those missiles did manage to slip through and strike Air Force bases. They insist that no aircraft were damaged or military facilities, only some office buildings and maintenance facilities suffered uh, damage. Now, the focus right now really does seem to be shifting to how Israel will respond. We understand a number of options are on the table, according to Israeli media, including targeting essential infrastructure in Iran, like oil and gas rigs. We do understand also stateside conversations are underway based on US reporting around how the US would support any sort of retaliation from Israel and crucially whether it would come to its defense should Tehran to decide to respond in kind. Certainly the message from Iran to Israel, it would appear publicly, is that any sort of reaction from Israel to what happened here will garner yet an even stronger response. That was Trent Murray on the tensions in the Middle East. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned the tensions in the Middle East following Iran's ballistic missile attack on Israel. Iran launched approximately 200 ballistic missiles towards Israel. It stated it was in response to the killings of Hassan Nasrallah and the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corp Commander Abbas Nil Farushan last week as well as that of Hamas leader Ismail Aniyeh in Tehran in July. Millions of people across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory were forced to seek shelter. As I did in relation to the Iranian attack in April, 
and this should have been obvious in the context of the condemnation I expressed, I again strongly condemn massive missile attacks by Iran on Israel. And these attacks, paradoxically, do nothing to support the cause of the Palestinian people or reduce their suffering. Iran's attack caused few casualties and little damage, but it marks further escalation of tensions in the region as Israeli forces battle Tehran's militant allies in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip. At the heart of the recent escalation is the nearly year-long war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Palestinian officials say Israel launched air and ground operations in the territory's southern city of Han Yunus on Wednesday, killing more than 50 people. Guterres calls for an end of the deadly cycle of violence. It's high time to stop the sickening cycle of escalation after escalation that is leading the people of the Middle East straight over the cliff. Each escalation has served as a pretext for the next. We must never lose sight of the tremendous toll that this growing conflict is taking on civilians. And we cannot look away from systematic violations of international humanitarian law. This deadly cycle of tit-for-tat violence must stop. Israeli forces are now carrying out what they say are limited ground incursions into uh, southern Lebanon. Chinese envoy has urged all parties, especially Israel, to exercise restraint. Chinese ambassador to the United Nations, Fu Tsong, told the Security Council the member countries must be united in making clear and unequivocal demands, including for an immediate ceasefire. The current situation is hanging by a thread. We urge all parties, especially Israel, to exercise restraint and avoid taking any actions that may lead to further escalation of the situation. The Chinese representative also stressed the return to a political settlement and stopping the further spillover of the conflict. Arab governments have condemned Israel's attacks and called for an end to hostilities to avoid the conflict from spiraling out of control. On the streets of Beirut, the displaced are hoping for an early stop to the fighting, Adele al Maruki reports. The Middle East is in the midst of one of its worst regional conflicts. Missiles from Iran heading to Israel have forced the closure of air spaces of all countries between the two nations and there has been an increased risk of a wider and more devastating regional war breaking out in recent days. Mostly the children were scared, even from the sound of the smallest bombs. So missiles terrified children, so we had to carry our children and get out of the bombed place, as well as families who were harmed without any reason. Nobody's families were left. We were confident they would respond, and happy they did even if it was a late response. We are not afraid of an expanded war in Lebanon as long as we have the right to fight. We own this land, they are attacking us. Let them do whatever they want. We have people who can respond. Whoever dies will go to God, and whoever remains will keep fighting. In Lebanon, Israel bombed nearly 18 villages adjacent to its border in the south. It instructed people living in 24 villages to leave their homes in what is seen as a sign that a bigger military operation could be carried out there. Analysts expect further Israeli attacks deeper into Lebanon. Infiltrating Lebanon's border is an expected approach based on a classical military mindset. Battles can never be decisive without ground operations, but the latest attacks the resistance made against Israel shows that they are ready to do more. The resistance groups are ready, and by that I also mean those in Yemen and Iraq. In the Middle East, Arab countries have condemned Israel's ongoing attacks. Egypt says the region is at a dangerous crossroads due to what it says are Israel's unilateral moves that Cairo warns will lead the region to a more dangerous path. The Arab League held an emergency meeting on Wednesday to discuss these latest developments. There is a regional outcry for the international community to take any immediate step to end the wars in Gaza and Lebanon before the Middle East sinks in an unstoppable, fully-fledged wide war. And that was Adele al Maruki reporting. Coming up, a typhoon's causing all kinds of disruptions in southeast China. Discover the realities and responses to our changing climate with Climate Watch. Uncover critical issues such as the Maasai Mara's disrupted rotor beast migration and the drop in the Panama Canal's water levels. Delve into solutions for a sustainable future. 
Tune in to Climate Watch on your favorite podcast platform. Become more eco-conscious and take action to protect our planet. About twenty minutes past the hour. A U.S. vice presidential candidates have faced off in their only debate with only a month remaining until the election. Republican J.D. Vance and Democrat Tim Walz avoided personal attacks in what most people saw as a polite encounter in New York City. Karina Mitchell has highlights. In a largely cordial but at times passionate vice presidential debate, Democratic Governor Tim Walz and Republican Senator J.D. Vance went after the presidential candidates instead of each other. Kamala Harris is bringing us a new way forward. She's bringing us a politics of joy. She's bringing real solutions for the middle class, and she's centering you at the heart of that. I believe that whether you're rich or poor, you ought to be able to afford a nice meal for your family. That's gotten harder because of Kamala Harris's policies. But there were some tense moments when it came to hot button issues, like the escalating conflict in the Middle East. So Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon than they were before because of Donald Trump's fickle leadership. It is up to Israel what they think they need to do to keep their country safe, and we should support our allies wherever they are. Immigration was one topic where the two showcased sharp differences. Vance saying Harris's border policies have failed, and Trump policies, including building a wall and mass deportations, should be re-implemented. Walls firing back, saying remarks that Vance made about Haitian immigrants in Ohio vilified them. On abortion, both stuck to party lines while Vance acknowledged the issue is complicated and Republicans must do a better job at earning back the trust of Americans on the issue. Let voters make these decisions. Let the individual states make their abortion policy. And I think that's what makes the most sense in a very big, a very diverse, and let's be honest, sometimes a very, very messy and divided country. Just mind your own business on this. Things work best when Roe versus Wade was in place. Both candidates misstated facts during the debate, like Walsh's false claim that Republicans want to create a, quote, registry of pregnancies. Moderators pressed Vance to explain why he said Trump was unfit for office and Trump's economic policies were failures. With no other debate scheduled and just over one month left before the November election, it's unclear what effect, if any, the debate will have on what the polls show is an incredibly tight race. That was Karina Mitchell on the vice presidential debate in the United States. Uh, Typhoon Krathon slammed into southeast China. Fujian province has suspended most passenger ferry services. The Taiwan region's on high alert as offices and schools remain shut, with hundreds of flights canceled and financial markets closed. At least two people have died on the island. Andy Lee has details from Taipei. Normally during typhoon season, typhoons attacking Taiwan would be making landfall in the eastern part in Hualien or in Taidong. However, this one is quite special. It's making landfall in the southwestern part of Taiwan, which is more densely populated. And so people here in Taiwan are taking all the precaution they can. Now, the island's authorities have already shut down the island two consecutive days, shutting down offices, businesses, schools, and even financial markets. Now, hundreds of flights in and out of this island of Taiwan has been affected. Local authorities here in Taiwan are also warning people to stay away from the seaside, the beach, and from the mountainous areas in case of storm surges in the beach, coastal areas, or mudslides in the mountainous areas. And yes, two people have sustained um, fatality right now here in Taiwan, one in Hualien, an old man was pruning tree, he fell off the tree due to the typhoon wind and rain. And then another one was a driver in Taidong who crashed into falling rocks. So two fatalities and 10,000 people were evacuated and more than 100 are injured. That was Andy Lee reporting. Hurricane Helene's left millions without electricity, water, and phone service across the southeast United States. Helene's become the deadliest hurricane to hit the U.S. mainland since Hurricane Katrina in 2005, killing over 190, with many more missing. Volunteers are serving meals for residents in Lake Lure. Volunteer Sarah Sue Miller uh, says they're planning to stay and serve meals longer. Plan to be here as long as the community needs us, uh, probably three weeks, and we will be serving meals at lunch, the noon meal and the evening meal, possibly three weeks or however long the community needs us. Over 6,300 National Guard members have mobilized to support the disaster relief, rescue, and recovery efforts. U.S. President Joe Biden's announced the deployment of up to 1,000 active duty soldiers to reinforce the North Carolina National Guard. 
Mexican soldiers have killed six migrants when they opened fire on a group traveling in a truck that had tried to evade a military patrol. Another 10 were injured. The truck was carrying 33 people from Egypt, Nepal, Cuba, India, and Pakistan. Mexico's Ministry of Defense revealed the incident took place on a highway near the border with Guatemala. The area is a common route for smuggling migrants to the United States. The Defense Ministry said soldiers claimed they heard shots as the truck and uh, two other vehicles approached their position, and then two officers opened fire. The military has removed the officers from their posts and reported them to federal prosecutors while a military tribunal carries out its own investigation. It's not the first time Mexican forces have opened fire on vehicles carrying migrants in the area, which is also the object of turf battles between warring drug cartels. In 2021, the National Guard opened fire on a pickup truck carrying migrants, killing one and wounding four others. Turning to tennis news, and world number three, Carlos Alcaraz, has captured his first China Open title by beating defending champion Yannick Sinner in three grueling sets in Beijing. The Spaniard rallied from a set down and held his serve in a deciding tie break to beat the world number one and claim his fourth title of the season. The final lasted nearly three and a half hours, becoming the longest men's singles match in the tournament's history. Alcaraz has snapped Sinner's 15-match winning streak and now holds a 6-4 lead over his rival in their head-to-head matchups. And it was a, a really special win for me, uh, lifting this trophy uh, in front of, uh, of my team, of part of my family. It was, uh, it was a, great, a great, uh, great moment for me. A sitter went into the final after lifting his second Grand Slam trophy of the season at the U.S. Open while also dealing with an ongoing doping case. Uh, he's disappointed at his loss in the Chinese capital. Today was not my day. He, he played better in important moments, and and you know that's it. But I'm 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 proud again of of, of a great week. Um, you know, making finals here last year, I won here, so it's for sure a place where I love to play. And um, and yeah, so I'm already looking forward for next year. And on the women's side, fa- home favorite Jung Chin Wen has reached the quarterfinals for the first time. Jung will face Mira Andreeva of Russia in the quarterfinals on Friday. We're at 27 past now. Beijing's down to 8 degrees on Thursday evening. Friday will be sunny and the high is 21. And Nanchung's down to 16, followed by sunshine and 25. In Taiwan, uh, Tai Tung will, get, will be getting heavy rainfall under Typhoon Krathen uh, with lows of 23, then a slight rain and 27 degrees on Friday. Elsewhere in Asia, Islamabad's down to 19. Friday, we'll see a slight rain in 33. Vientiane's at 22 overnight, then overcast in 32 degrees. Phnom Penh's at 24 degrees overnight. Friday has a slight rain in 30 degrees Celsius. And that's it of the special holiday edition of the Beijing Hour. Coming up, present you with an episode of our Footprints program where we share the, the true life stories of people chasing dreams in China. Uh, today, we'll tell you the story of a French professional footballer who's now playing for China's Qingdao Red Lions. Making news today, Chinese authorities have reported tens of millions of passenger trips on the third day of the National Day Golden Week holiday. The box office totals for the holiday period have already surpassed 1 billion yuan. Lebanese officials say an Israeli attack that struck a health center in Beirut has killed at least six people. And a Chinese envoy at the UN has called for a de-escalation of the tensions in the Middle East. On behalf of the staff, this is Shane Bigham in the Chinese capital, hoping you'll join us for the next edition of the Beijing Hour and open a window to the world together. The best military commander is not he who fights a hundred battles and wins every one of them. The best military strategy does not lead to the desiccation of the enemy's capital city. Decoding the art of war will help you understand why there's no art in war and how Sun Tzu stayed undefeatable using the science of war with fun stories and insightful breakdown of famous battles. Find Decoding the Art of War wherever you listen. Home. I love you, Betty. Love. Remember? Thank you. Bing an, bing bing an an. Fate. Take care. Take care. Tuan. Me tuan. What do they truly mean? Dasha, where did you go? Dasha, Dasha! Embark on a century long journey with CGTN Radio's latest offering Echoes of Kulian. 
a gripping audio drama series inspired by real life tales. Has anyone heard of a Godashan? From unexpected encounters to heartfelt reunions, immerse yourself in a narrative of love, peace, and enduring friendship. He's a piece of my lost childhood. Listen to Echoes of Kulia on radio.cgtn.com and all major podcast platforms. Bing An. Bing. Bing An. Bing An. From north to south, east to west, people in China are chasing their dreams and leaving their mark. Want to know how they beat the odds and made a difference? Footprints brings you the true life stories of their journeys. French professional footballer Yaya Senego became a household name after he joined the English Premier League side Arsenal when he was just 19. Having played in Europe only, Senego decided to explore a new chapter by signing with a Chinese team this March. In this episode of Footprints, we explore Senego's journey with Chinese club Qingdao Red Lions and find out his perspectives on China and its football culture. When we visited Sanago, he and Red Lions were preparing for the Chinese FA Cup game in the fourth round. They were about to face first-tier club Shenzhen Peng City in a key matchup. Win or go home, it was a big challenge. But to Sanago, challenges are already something he's used to throughout his career. I just signed two days before the league start. I didn't have pre-season like the guys. I ran behind my form. You know, and new culture, new teammate. You know, I didn't have enough time, with the jet lag, and to adapt so quick. I think uh, I was proud, you know. And when I scored the first goal, I was like, you know, I feel the great sensation. Like how many football stars commenced their career, Sanago fell in love with football when he was just a little child. He showed talent, which was quickly discovered by his school. That changed his life. I started football at, when I was five years old, uh, at the school of the beginning when I started. And uh, I think, uh, if I remember, it was my teacher over, over from school tell to my mom to, to follow me in football because he, see, he saw I have some talent. So after that, my mom uh, bring me uh, at the football, so I start at six, around six. It was hard because uh, my mom said to him, I'm so young, or oh, he, he can see I have talent at this age. I think, you know, when you play at this age, you just want to play for fun. But I think uh, in my mentality, mm, I want to be professional, you know, because I like quickly the football, you know. In the early stages of his career, Sonogo was seen as the next big thing in French football. Standing 1.91 meters tall with excellent ball control skills, he was a key member of the nation's youth team and won the 2013 FIFA U20 World Cup. Sonogo's future looked bright. For fans of a football management simulation video game, Yaya Sanogo was a famous name before he had even made his senior debut for French club Osek at the age of 16. Sanogo set Didier Drogba, his idol, as his target. The forward from Côte d'Ivoire was one of the best strikers in the world. The power, speed, skills of this player made Sanogo obsessed. He wanted to become another Drogba, scoring splendid goals and winning countless glories. No, I support him when he played Marseille, when he play Chelsea, when he score every week, I celebrate with him. I play uh, against him uh, when he play uh, at Galatasaray. We play each other, and after the game, he talked with me, he, adv he advised me, and he saw we won the World Cup last two months ago, so he was very happy for us and for me. So it was just advice, like advice to big boy, you know, great memory. However, unlike Drogba, Sonogo's professional career has been full of ups and downs. In the beginning, people held high expectations in him. European scouts were following him on a daily basis. A phone call decided Sonogo's fate. It was Arsene Winger, manager of English Premier League side Arsenal. 
playing for one of the best clubs in the world under one of the best managers was an offer few players could turn down, especially for 20-year-old Sonago, who was seeking the opening chapter of his career. It was like a dream come true. The feeling was amazing because, uh, you know, when you receive some call from this big club, you know, you, you feel proud of yourself, you know, especially when uh, Arsene Wenger calling you. I didn't believe, like, like when he called me. I didn't have number of England, you know, it's plus four, four, four. When I saw the indicative and he said, hello, Mr. Yaya Sanogo, he's Arsene Wenger. I said, no, maybe I dream, you know, I just wake up. It's true, <laughs> because he's interesting about me, so. And after he said, yeah, can we talk? And when we talk, he said, yeah, he has, if we can meet each, each other, I meet him. And, you know, the discussion was very quick. I was in my flat. I was just, I look around, I go outside and I said, ah, God. Because I said, maybe, you know, it's not true. <laughs> I said, I will wait until I see him. After, maybe, I will say to, to my family. But I said, maybe, you know, I wasn't sure until uh, I see Arsene Wenger. In 2013, Sonago penned a long-term contract with Arsenal. Hopes were high for him in North London. He was seen as a young player full of promise and raw talent, and a gamble worth taking, especially after he was nominated for the Golden Boy Award in 2013. He was integrated into the first team straight away. But eventually, it didn't work out for him at Emirates Stadium. The only highlight for Sonago's Arsenal stay was four goals scored in a pre-season friendly against Benfica. Injuries struck him, ultimately affecting his career. In the end, the Frenchman made just 20 first-team appearances with the North London club in four years. Stains on loan at different clubs were followed by a move back to France with Toulouse. Sonago played a few quiet seasons in Europe. His next move was somewhere he had not expected himself to be. Qingdao, a coastal city in North China with a population of over 10 million, boasts three professional football clubs across different levels of Chinese leagues. Football is in the genes of the city. Competitive local clubs combined with a strong beer culture make a great football atmosphere here. It's also where Yaya Sonago started another chapter in his career. The Frenchman joined Red Lions in a surprising move he had never signed with a club outside Europe before. They contacted me, uh, one, uh, one of uh, my agent, and after he said, Chindao uh, are interesting about me, if I'm agree, you know, because he's, he knows, he already knows that I had an offer from uh, Europe, and he convinced me to, to come here and see if I can come to China. A bold decision, but also a new adventure. Sonago said he decided to play in China because he wanted to explore more in his football life. He rejected many offers, including from Scottish clubs, to join the Chinese side. I just played in Europe before, and in my head I didn't know what I will accept. When this offer coming, I said, OK, you need to stay at Europe, but you know the Europe you play for more, more than 10 years. So now China come, this offer. So I need to see Asia because I've been to Asia in 2009 for a tournament. So it was a great experience, you know. We played against uh, Brazil. I scored memorable goals. And I remember about Asia, I said, OK, it was good, actually. So why not? You can go to, uh, to China to see, you know. It was easy decision. And I said, OK. Let's go. Sonago's family was initially against his move to China. Living in a remote country away from the loved ones made them anxious. And what some Western media described about China made them believe this is not a safe country. There was a lot of hesitation in the air. They were scared a little bit because, you know, I'm alone here. Mm, not with my family, with the cold, with jet lag, it's hard to to have them every day. So they were scared a little bit, but at the end, it's my, my decision. 
they can say anything. So I accept this offer and I, and I come. But since Sanago landed in China, he discovered a new and different side of this country. The initial concerns were gone immediately. It was not only about his life in Qingdao, but also some enjoyable trips to other Chinese cities during their away games. He's found a friendly country that is modern, inclusive, and more importantly, safe. He tries to convince everyone around him now that China is different from what they have been told. I think they need to come. <laughs> you know, because we are, they put some information like, like negative about China in other country. I said to them, you need to come to see China. It's completely different. For me, I was very surprised. China is very safe, uh, very open. It's completely different than Europe. And I saw many cities. People are very kind, you know, no pressure. I've been to Shanghai, to Beijing, to Guangzhou. I saw the city and it's not like people talk in Europe. That's always I said to them, you need to come, you will see. After you can make the conclusion. Sanago said he would travel in China someday with his family and let them experience what China is really like today. Sanago found a new perspective about China, but more importantly, he has regained his scoring form. In the first 10 league games with Qingdao, he netted five goals and provided one assist, showcasing impressive efficiency on the pitch. Sanago adapted quickly. It took him just a few months to go from knowing nothing about the team to becoming a pillar in their attack. The team has also greatly benefited from Sanago's contributions consistently performing well in the league and securing a firm mid-table position. Uh, to be fair, I didn't know about anything about uh, the club. I just uh, Google and I saw some, you know, the culture, the city, but I didn't know properly about the club, you know. I said, yeah, when I will arrive there, I will see and I will learn, you know. You know, it is, it is a great club, you know, it's a good club. They promoted to third division to second division. I think uh, we, we did a great job at the moment. Everybody may be half surprised because they didn't think we are, I think we are nine of the league or 10. And you know, when you just came to third division, it's hard sometimes, you know. And I think we did, uh, we have a great squad, good player. It's Qingdao Red Lions' first season in the China League, the second-tier professional competition of the Chinese Football Association. As a rookie team, they needed to recruit quality players to handle the more intense games. It was a quick match between Sanago and Red Lions. Things didn't start smoothly as there was little time for both sides to adapt. Injuries hit Sanago again, complicating matters. But once he was ready, he proved he was worth the wait. Head coach Sun Qingbo expressed his satisfaction with Sanago's role at the club, knowing he would be a significant part of the team. Basically, he's met our expectations. Before he came, he didn't go through the systemic training with us. We were informed about being promoted to the second tier in the last minute, so we got only a week to make the decision on signing a foreign player and deal with this transfer. Everything was in a rush. For him, it was also a big challenge. Ahead of the first game since he arrived, I asked him if he could be available. He said, you are a professional coach, you know my training was enough in the off-season for me to handle high-intensity games. But then, fans in Qingdao already knew his arrival. Yaya Sanogo is a well-known name. Fans had high expectations for him, and people were eager to see him play. Finally, I substituted him on in the final minutes for an official appearance. But he suffered some pain in his leg after that game. 
we spent almost a month and a half for his body rehabilitation. Until the fifth round against Wu Xi, I eventually made him in the starting 11, and he was amazing in that game. He scored fantastic goals, and we finally witnessed his iconic move of goal celebration, zombie crawl. Everyone was excited and inspired. So it was a difficult start, but Yaya helped us a lot. We also have designed tactics revolving around him. Team captain Sun Chu also looks up to Sanago, calling him a valuable asset for the squad on and off the field. He performs really well. He's the pillar in our attack. We need his support, and he's always ready to help. He used to play in the top European leagues and has stints at premier clubs. We learn a lot from him. He's a model in self-discipline and always work hard in training. We appreciate that. Red Lions were preparing to face the Chinese Super League side Shenzhen Peng City, a team that competes in the league higher than Red Lions. It's a challenge for both Qingdao and Sanago. Coach Sun said he would like to see Sanago to go 100% and help the team win the tough battle. Tomorrow against Shenzhen, we need a Yaya with full motivation. He will definitely face stronger competition against the Super League club. He can control the ball while leaning against defenders. He's got impressive capabilities inside the penalty area. He may not be able to be involved in defense around midfield that much, but he tries his best to carry that responsibility as well. His height and his power make him an attacking threat. He's got great shooting skills. We rely on him in attack and see him as a finisher. Only scoring goals can we win. We've talked a lot. He's quite happy about the current situation with the team, and he's very satisfied with the tactics around him. Facing such a strong opponent, the last thing the players need is nervousness. Instead, they welcome the knockout match in a light mood. Small, fun footballing games help here. Split into different groups, they play header relay and kick volleyball games. Love to field the training ground. Later, an interest squad competition reminds the players to focus on their roles in the game. Two hours of training was exhausting. Sanago went to the gym afterwards for extra workouts. Diligence leads to success and it's a value in China. Sanago said he learned how hard Chinese people work and he's willing to keep pace. This makes it much easier for him and the club to work together. Every culture and every country are completely different. So for me, I learn quickly about different culture because I travel a lot since uh, 19. So it was new for me, but Chinese people are very kind. They, are, they work very hard. That I really appreciate. For me, it's a good uh, experience. Sanago's professionalism is valued by head coach Sun, who also praises his leadership role in the locker room. His attitude and his professionalism are excellent. That's also why he can maintain this level and keep playing at this age. I have simple requests about him, scoring more goals. But his influence is beyond just goal scoring. In the locker room, he always inspires teammates in his own way. He also helps a lot on the growth of our young players. He has become a crucial part of this team. Swin also likes how Sanago roots for the club, as if it's his second home. With him, every day the team is filled with positive atmosphere. He likes talking to each other. Just now, I told him the opponents will come soon for pre-game training sessions. I couldn't put our penalty shootout practice in the end because the other side would see our arrangement. He said, oh, we should never leak this to them. We must practice spot kick after the passing practice and before the full squad training, so they won't be able to see our plan. He gets me. Little things like this happen every day inside the team.
match day. Head coach Sun gathered all the players for the final meeting ahead of the knockout game. He emphasized the need for fighting spirits and the concentration on the pitch. Facing Shenzhen, the coach told his players not to feel too much pressure and to see themselves as challengers. Sanago was put up front as the sole forward, focusing on receiving the ball from the back and creating chances for his teammates. Sanago's height is the most lethal weapon in the squad, and the coach Sun designed different set-piece strategies, hoping to find him in the air. After a simple meal, the team set off to the stadium. They would play at Qingdao West Coast's home stadium as a neutral venue for cup game. Fans were already outside the stadium, cheering for their home team. As a young club, Qingdao Red Lions attract a lot of teenage fans. They are proud of this team and they very much look forward to Yaya Sanago's performance that night. He's an essential part of this red line squad. He can create chances for teammates and he can score by himself. We were all excited when he learned that he was joining red lines. I mean, he was an Arsenal player. We had full expectations for him. He played in high-level games before with Arsenal, so I was eager to see his games. He has delivered his best so far. His header is especially impressive. We appreciate his decision to join Red Lions, and he has injected new impetus into this team. Inside the locker room, every player was busy preparing themselves for the upcoming game. Coach Sun kept telling the players not to be stressed, but tension was palpable. Sanago listened to music and had some bananas. That's how he calms himself down ahead of games. A quick snack gives him the energy boost to get through the first half. A pre-game massage was also necessary to ensure the body was physically ready, preventing potential non-contact injuries during the game. Sanago put on his shirt. Here's the game. It's a physical game. A fierce tackle already hurt Red Lions midfielder Samuel Osamoa's back early on. Red Lions managed to find some space on the wings, but they couldn't connect with Sanagol in the middle. The two teams were in a stalemate around midfield and created few opportunities. The first half ended new new. Back in the locker room at halftime, the head coach was happy about the team's performance in the first 45 minutes. He hoped they would keep pace with Shenzhen in the second half. The coach emphasized that players should pass the ball more decisively to find Sanogol and create more chances. The adjustment almost paid off. Switching the side, Red Lion sped up in their attack. More one-touch passes troubled Shenzhen's defense. Sanogol was heavily marked, but still managed to deliver two nice feeds up front. Unfortunately, his teammates missed those open shots. On the other side, a huge defensive mistake led to a foul on the Shenzhen forward inside the box. Penalty. Edu Garcia converted the spot kick. Thiago Lianco's individual effort later extended Peng City's lead. Worn out, Red Lions were unable to organize effective attack. Sanago was substituted off. Final whistle. Qingdao suffered a 2-0 defeat and got knocked out from the Chinese FA Cup. Despite the frustrating loss, Sanago didn't lose faith in his team. He believed Qingdao could get better if they learned from losses like this. It's hard to, to lose the game, you know, because every game, every game you train our best to win. And today we conceded some, I think, stupid goal, but, you know, it's a cup game. Now we need to be focus for next game is a uh, is, uh, league and uh, that's most important thing. We, we need to learn about uh, some game like this, you know, 
trying to didn't make uh, some mistake like this, like today. So for learn very quick and trying our best, you know. Sanago said he's impressed with the competitiveness of Chinese football teams, and there are some good players from both his team and the opponents. In our league, you never know if you will win or not, especially big team when they play against us. They think maybe it will be easy, and you know, it's, they see it very hard because it's very physical. And you see, the league is tight; not many points to first to ten, ten to sixteen. You know, yeah, very intense. Sanago also gave his advice for players who are potentially considering a move to China. To come in China, you need to put your feet in the league for stay for trying to stay longer. Some player calling me about uh, China, oh, is China, or the league, the, the lifestyle, you know. I recommend, I said, you can come. The, the league is nice. Your lifestyle is good, you know, and especially the football. I didn't know about football, but it's good. So if you have some club are interesting about you, you you can come because I'm happy in China. So because many players are calling me about China. If you have this opportunity, I said to them, take it. It's not the same market like Europe. Sanogo is on the road of pursuing his football success in Qingdao. He said he hopes to leave his mark on Qingdao Red Lions and the fans in this city. I need to, to do my best to help the team. You know, with God, every, everything is possible. And if you have a strength and you work out, everything is possible, you know. Me, I just want to focus on my job. I didn't play consistently like this. I can say now I feel like 60% uh, of my level. Every game I progress. If I continue like this, keep working hard like this, I think it will be very interesting. With that, we come to an end of this episode of Footprints. If you're interested in knowing the lives of ordinary but incredible people in China, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Just key in Footprints, and you can find more stories anytime, anywhere. Bye for now. I cannot marry you. While your mother regards me. Step into the world of timeless elegance with Mrs. Spring Fragrance, a captivating audiobook by Edith Eaton, read by Man Ling. Because the green leaf still clings to the bough. Experience the lively yet complex lives in Chinese American communities at the turn of the 20th century as Edith Eaton's delicate prose weaves together song. themes of because tradition, change, Love and identity. Forget all that belongs to the joy of life. Follow the journey of Mrs. Spring Fragrance and witness the struggles and fights of those living on a rapidly changing exotic land while holding on to their cultural traditions or more importantly, to their identities. You could hardly believe that his daughter was seriously opposed to becoming the wife of a such a good-looking, prosperous young merchant as Wang Ling. Join Books and Beyond for Mrs. Spring Fragrance. Let the stories come to life in your imagination. Subscribe to Books and Beyond for free on your favorite podcast platforms or log on to radio.cgtn.com for more. 我爱你, I love you. 我爱你. This might be the easiest way to say I love you, since there are so many other romantic expressions. No matter if you are a rookie, 你好, or a sophisticated learner, 我来北京五年了, there is definitely something that will interest you. Check out Takeaway Chinese, a world that starts with 你好。75 years ago, a new chapter in history began. A momentous journey of resilience, innovation, and unity. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Join us for a special series as we speak to renowned politicians, economists, 
and senior officials of international organizations about their personal experiences and views on the events that have defined modern China. From the triumphs of the past to the promises of tomorrow, we'll explore the milestones, challenges, and remarkable progress that have made China a global power that continues to shape the international stage. Subscribe to the Chat Lounge for the 75 years of China's rise on your favorite podcast platform as we commemorate this unforgettable journey.